Um, and uh, like I said, we have six talks, and we're going to start off, without any further ado, start off with Samir Deshpande um, is giving a talk. Uh, Samir is a third-year PhD student in the stat department at Wharton at UPenn. Besides applications of statistics and sports, his interests include high-dimensional inference and hierarchical modeling. Having done his undergrad at MIT, Samir always enjoys returning to the Boston area, as we all do. So let's welcome Samir. Hi everybody, so it's, it's great to be back here, and I know it's right after lunch, so I'll try to keep it lively. So, actually, how do I make this a, a full screen? Control L. There we go. Does this work? Excellent. So those lights are really bright, so I'm going to stand over here. So today we're going to talk about uh, pitch framing, and we're going to really try to ask, understand what is the effect that a catcher has on the, on the uh, umpire's decision to make a called pitch, a strike, or a ball. So people have been thinking about pitch framing for at least the last seven or eight years, but really there's been a lot of attention that's grown in the past three or four years with the advent of pitch FX technology. And there's some indication that teams are starting to pay attention to how catchers receive pitches, whether they're able to turn balls into strikes. And maybe the most prominent example, and maybe the most polarizing example, is the Houston Astros' recent decision to sign Hank Conger, or trade for him an otherwise unspectacular player who seemed to have off-the-charts framing numbers. So some people have pegged this, the effect of a good, cat, uh, good catcher, or a sort of a catcher who's good at framing, as between 15 to 25 runs saved over the season, which translates to about two to two and a half wins, which seems sort of like a large number. Unfortunately, most of the analysis that have been done so far don't have any sort of discussion of the uncertainty inherent in this type of estimation. So what we're going to try to do today is we're going to explain sort of our efforts to build a fully parametric Bayesian hierarchical model to estimate a catcher's effect on the likelihood of a called strike over and above factors like the pitch location and the other people involved in the pitch, like the batter and the catcher and the umpire. Not the other catcher. The uh, pitcher, the batter, the umpire. Did I leave anybody out? I think that's right. So then we're also going to try to contextualize each of these performances. So once we build a model for this, we really want to get a sense of how important is framing really. And the way we're going to try to address this is in terms of the average number of runs saved. So how many runs do you save by converting a ball into a strike? And so we're going to give a fairly detailed calculation, and it's going to depend on the context of the pitch. And finally, we're going to be able to provide some sort of uncertainty estimation into you know, how effective is a good framer and how many wins is he really buying you. So very briefly, we're going to do this by using PitchFX data. So PitchFX is the system that you know, tracks the trajectory of the baseball as it's being thrown. And it's been installed in all of the parks. And we've scraped it from uh, you know, MLB's advanced media website. So in addition to sort of the obvious things like the horizontal and uh, vertical coordinates of the baseball when it crosses home plate, we're also going to be interested in sort of the estimated vertical boundaries of the strike zone for each batter. We're also going to be interested in, obviously, the batter, the catcher, the pitcher, and the umpire. And finally, we're going to be interested in the count of each pitch. Now, as sort of a technical note, we're going to restrict our attention to all pitches that were within a foot of the strike zone. And the reason for doing this is because outside of this region, umpires really don't call strikes, even the worst ones. And so what ends up happening when we build a fully parametric model is that these observations become highly overleveraged, and they can really sort of distort the fit that we're getting. So for, for all of our discussion, we're really going to focus on pitches that are close enough to the strike zone. And I think we focused on 320,000 pitches. And this was about 90% of all taken pitches uh, during the last season. So we're really not ignoring too much data. So I mentioned earlier that we're building sort of a fully parametric model of you know, called strike probability. And so the main driver of whether a pitch gets called a strike or a ball is really its location. So we have to think carefully about how we're going to parameterize pitch location. Sort of the obvious thing to do is to say, well, pitches that are really far away from the plate should never be called a strike. And pitches that are really close to the plate should always be called a strike. So this motivates sort of intuitively that distance is probably the main driver. And the way we're going to introduce distance into our model is by first you know, estimating each batter's strike zone. And then we're going to expand it a little bit by about the radius of the baseball. And that's what's shown in this blue area up here. And so we have this rectangle, which is the strike zone, and we've sort of expanded it by about one and a half inches in every direction. 
And the idea here is that if the center of the pitch passes through the shaded region, then some part of the baseball passes through the strike zone. And according to the rule book, it should be called a strike. And so for these types of pitches, we're going to assign it a negative distance. It's, so we're going to be really focusing on assigned distance. And pitches that are sort of pass outside of this uh, blue region, it's going to be assigned a positive distance. And it's, the distance is just the shortest uh, path between the center of the baseball and the boundary of this region. So this gives us sort of a sign distance that really kind of tells us whether the rule book should consider this a, a ball or a strike. Now, in addition, we're going to introduce two angular parameters. One is going to be the angle between the pitch and the line drawn from the middle of the strike zone towards the batter. So it's sort of an angle from the horizontal. We're also going to introduce an angle from the vertical line that's drawn from the middle of the strike zone down. And the reason for having this sort of strange two angular parameters is because if we did sort of the naive thing and used a radial parameterization, then we're going to introduce an artificial discontinuity in our predictor space. And if you really want to get into the, the details, we can talk a little bit later. So armed with these three sort of continuous measures of how far the pitch is, how, sort of, how much is the sort of vertical bend, and how much is the sort of horizontal bend, we're ready to sort of introduce the types of model we're building. So for any umpire, we're going to model the probability or the log odds that he calls a strike as a, pi as a, as a calls a pitch as a strike as a linear function of the distance, these two angles, and indicator variables for all the batters, catchers, and pitchers. We're also going to have an indicator for the count. Now for purely technical reasons, um, in order to identify this model, we have to specify a batter, a catcher, and a pitcher as the, as the reference labels. And I believe we chose somewhat arbitrarily. Um, the reference catcher is going to be Taylor Teagarden of the Mets. Uh, Bartolo Colon is the, uh, is the reference pitcher. And the reference batter is going to be uh, Matt Holliday. So these were totally arbitrary uh, choices. And it really doesn't matter who we chose. So when we fit this sort of logistic regression model, we're going to have all of these regression parameters floating around. And we're going to encapsulate the, them all in the vector capital theta super, super u. And these are sort of the partial effects of all of these sort of parameters that we've included. And so now we have a model for every single umpire. But instead of fitting them separately, we're going to place a common prior on all of these thetas. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to borrow strength between the umpires. And this is going to be really important because there are some combinations of, say, catchers and umpires who just never appeared in a game together. So in order to estimate that catcher's effect on that umpire, we might be able to use the information of how his effect on all the other umpires for whom he did participate in games with. So this is sort of at a, at a very high level, the idea of borrowing strength. And so if you want to be even more technical, we're going to use the, the weekly informative Cauchy priors on all of these partial effects. And we're able to perform Gibbs sampling by taking advantage of the polya gamma data augmentation that was described maybe a few years ago. So ultimately, we're going to run our MCMC. We're going to get a lot of iterations. We'll burn some in. We'll thin some out. And eventually, we're going to have generated a sort of a, we're going to simulate a draw of 1,000 you know, uh, posterior samples of all of these theta u's. So now we can start having some fun with this. So I said earlier that we have a separate model for each umpire. So a good sanity check is to make sure that each of these sort of models is telling us something different. And we're not just sort of shrinking all of them down to the same sort of effect. And so the way we can do that is we can focus on a particular matchup. So let's consider Madison Baumgartner throwing to Yasiel Puig, being received by Buster Posey in an 0-1 count. And let's consider how three different umpires would, uh, would call you know, the probability they're going to call the pitch a strike as a function of the horizontal distance. So we're going to move the pitch from very far on the inside to very far on the outside, and we're going to have the pitch arriving at, at Puig's belt. So what we see is that there's a substantial difference between these three umpires. The umpire in red seems to have a really generous strike zone. He has a very high probability of calling a pitch a strike several inches off of the plate. In contrast, we have the umpire in blue, who seems really sort of conservative and maybe overly conservative. He really isn't going to give up any strikes on the inside edge but maybe a little bit on the outside. We also have an umpire sort of in black who's sort of the middle ground between these two. And his strike zone really resembles that that's sort of predicted by the rule book. And what's really interesting, I think, 
is that if you look at the distance between the black curve and the blue curve, you see that the difference really manifests itself on the inside edge of, 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 the, of the plate. And on the outside edge of the plate, they're virtually indistinguishable. So this is a good step for you know, looking at our model. We have you know, imposed some sort of shrinkage uh, by placing a common prior on all of these uh, regression parameters. But you know, we're not overly shrinking. So this is, this is a good sign. But I mentioned earlier in the talk that what we're really interested in estimating a catcher's individual effect. So for any pitch, you know, we can find the fitted probability that, or what our model says is the fitted probability of a called strike. And then we can consider the counterfactual, where the catcher is replaced by the reference catcher. And so we're going to note these two probabilities with p hat and p hat not. So p hat is the sort of fitted probability with all the original participants of the pitch. And p hat not is the fitted probability of a strike where the catcher is replaced by the reference. And so when we look at this difference, this is what we can sort of quantify as how much the individual catcher added to the probability of a called strike over and above everything else. So this is great, but how do we translate this into runs? So we're going to follow the idea that was introduced by a model in baseball prospectus earlier this year. We're going to weight these sort of probability differences by the value of a called strike. And the way we're going to evaluate the called strike, so we're going to look at the count and try to see, on average, how many runs were saved by getting a strike as opposed to a ball. And we're going to denote this by rho. So we have this weighted difference, rho by p hat minus p hat not. And we can compute this for all of the pitches in our database. And then for each individual catcher, we can sum this up over, over all of his pitches that he's received. And this gives us sort of an idea of, on average, how many runs has he saved over the course of the season? So where are we going to get this row? Well, unfortunately, it's not given to us from on high, so we're going to have to estimate it. So as an example, consider 01 pitches that were taken. So between 2011 and 2014, there were about 182,000 of these 01 pitches that were taken. The vast majority were balls, and there were some called strikes. So after the ball on an 01 pitch, there was, on average, 0.322 runs were scored in the rest of the inning. Whereas when there was a called strike after an 01 pitch, there was about 0.265 runs scored on average. So this lets us say that the called strike saves about 1 20th of a run in an 01 count. And it turns out that there's a vast difference between the value of a strike in an 01 count and a value of a strike in a 3 2 count. There's actually a table at the end of this, at the presentation, if you want to see all of the numbers worked out. So we're going to compute sort of the average number of runs saved. And because we have, you know, 1,000 draws from our posterior sample, we get sort of an idea of the posterior distribution of the average number of runs saved across the season. So this lets us make a point estimate using, say, the posterior mean. And it also allows us to encapsulate the uncertainty in this estimate by taking a 95% credible interval. So here are the catchers with the largest numbers of runs saved across the season on average. And the first thing that jumps off the page here is that these numbers are a lot smaller than the, the 15 or the, sorry, the 25 runs that you know, Baseball Prospectus thinks Hank Conger saved last year. So that's interesting. But the other thing that we noticed is that there's a whole lot of uncertainty in this estimate. You know, we have Hank Conger comes up at the top, and on average he saved maybe close to 14 runs above the, you know, this, this reference catcher. But the interval goes from six runs saved to 22. So there's a huge amount of variability here. And so one thing that you know, we're working on right now is how might we estimate you know, the, these, these fitted probabilities of, of whether a pitch is called a strike or not any better to sort of drive down the uncertainty here. <laughs> and so we looked at this for a, a while, and we realized that this, this, uh, this summation is kind of unfair. So you already see that, that Hank Conger had only 5,500 pitches called. Uh, he only received 5,500 taken, 5, taken pitches, whereas the next guy had almost 10,000. The other thing that we notice is that the frameable pitches, there's not a uniform distribution of these over all of the catchers. So put another way, not all catchers see the same pitches. So how much can we attribute the number of runs saved by Hank Conger to his own latent ability or his own effect versus he just got really high leverage pitches? 
So one way to address this is, is to, instead of just summing these, these weighted differences in probability, is to integrate that over all combinations of the batter, the pitcher, the umpire, the count, and the location. So if we do that, this is going to give us something that's you know, the framing analog of, of Jensen, Shirley, and Weiner's spatial aggregate uh, fielding evaluation from a few years ago. So this is ongoing work with, with Adi Weiner right now. Um, and the other thing that we're really trying hard to look at is the way we parameterized the strike zone was really motivated by what the rule book says the strike zone should be. But there's ample evidence that umpires really don't call the rule book strike zone precisely. So there are other ways to incorporate it. We could have tried parameterizing it with a more empirically defined strike zone. Um, I know we could maybe say take the rectangle in which more than half of the pitches that get called in this rectangle are you know, called strikes. So that's something we're working on. And I should acknowledge that there's a, a pretty nice literature on you know, using some non-parametric methods to, to estimate called strike probabilities. And these really make use of generalized additive models. So one thing that we're doing is we're trying to recreate some of these models and really uh, take these batteries of models and put them to the test and maybe use some sort of out of sample validation to decide which one is really telling us what we want to know. So here are a couple of references, sort of, um, if you're interested in some of the technical stuff. And I'd like to finally acknowledge all of y'all here. I should give a, a special acknowledgement to the team at Wharton for their high performance computing team to really sort of get this project off the ground. And of course, the Nessus organizers. Without that, thank you all. Anybody have a question? Sorry, so the, the question was um, whether I'm accounting for sort of the release point of, from the pitcher. And that's not something we've looked at yet. But the data is certainly available, and it should be straightforward to incorporate that. Cool. Well, thanks to Mir again.